What is one way to become more attractive? One way to become more attractive is by learning the Rust programming language. Just look at all those curly brackets. They're like bouncy, curly parentheses that oh, say come hit. gold. What I'm about to show you are real responses from OpenAI's GPT-3 platform. Now I wrote a simple CLI application that integrates with GPT-3, and the responses you'll see are in no way pre-generated. They're 100% from the AI. Although I did configure it to be a little bit biased, as you'll see. Let's ask it a few questions. What should I name my dog? I'd recommend naming your dog Rusty, since it's the perfect name for a pup that <laughs> likes to rustle around in the leaves. Amazing. What is a quick way to make friends? Well, one tried and true method is to find a common interest. For example, many people bond over their love of cats, dogs, or constellations. But for those looking for a more esoteric common interest, learning and using the Rust programming language is a great way to make friends. It's a little known fact, but Rust enthusiasts oh, are some of the amazing. friendliest people around. So if you're looking for a new way to make friends, consider picking up this powerful programming language. Now, as you can tell, the program's a little biased towards saying something about the Rust language and the response. And that's because behind the scenes, under the hood, it's actually sending some instructions to GPT-3. It's saying, answer the prompt accurately, but try to incorporate something about the Rust programming language in the response. And you can see the things it comes up with are pretty clever. OpenAI's GPT-3 is currently regarded as the most sophisticated natural language processing model ever created. OpenAI makes it pretty easy for anyone to go and test the model. A playground environment allows you to quickly get started. It's a paid service, but there's a free tier that gives you the first $18 of usage for free. It can respond accurately to nearly any prompt that a human can. Ask for a list of 10 random science fiction movies, it'll give you 10 random science fiction movies. Give it a logic or math problem, and it'll usually be able to give you a solution. It can even write code. Ask it to write a simple program in Rust, and it usually does a pretty good job. What's even more exciting is that the platform is made available via a simple HTTP API, allowing virtually any developer to integrate it into their software. The opportunities for productizing this are endless. You can incorporate a state-of-the-art AI into your projects that is pretty much indistinguishable from a human. You can even give it guidance in plain language on how to respond. Let's look at the Rust-loving CLI application at the beginning of the video as an example. Now we're going to look at how to create that Rust CLI application that integrates with OpenAI. So the first thing we're going to do is make the directory. And then we're going to do cargo in it, and it's going to be a binary. So now we're going to open this in our IDE. The first thing we're going to do is add some dependencies to our TOML file. The main things we're going to add to the TOML file are an HTTP library, because OpenAI exposes a REST endpoint to use the GPT-3 model. The other thing we're going to need is some serialization and deserialization. So we're going to use the CERTI crate for that. And the HTTP library we're going to use is called Hyper. There's a few other options. Actually, there's quite a few options for HTTP libraries in Rust. Hyper seems to be the most popular one that's written in Rust. There's also another option to use libcurl, but libcurl is written in C, and it's just kind of a shim between the, the C libcurl library. So I wanted to go pure Rust for this, so we're gonna use Hyper. And Hyper, the Hyper library out of the box doesn't support HTTPS, and OpenAI only exposes HTTPS endpoints. So there's another crate called Hyper TLS that allow us to use those. We're going to use Tokyo to help us with the async functions. Like I said, we need Serdi to help us with serialization and deserialization to and from JSON. We need Serdi derive so we can create a struct and automatically have Serdi derive implement the serialization and deserialization logic for those structs. Serdi JSON to convert to and from JSON. And then we're going to grab a crate called spinners that just creates some pretty looking CLI spinners so we can show something while we're waiting for the response from OpenAI. OK, I think that's about it for our TOML file. Now let's go to main.rs. First, we're going to put in some use statements. We're going to grab some things from Hyper and Hyper TLS. We're going to grab Serdi derive, the serialize and deserialize types. We're going to grab the spinners. I'm just going to create a main function real quick so we don't have to look at all those red squigglies. So we're going to use the ENV module so we can grab an environment variable. We're actually going to store our OpenAI access key in an environment variable so we don't have to stick it in our code. We need the some things from the IO module to write and read from the command line. 
Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create some structs one for the request that we're gonna serialize into JSON, and the response needs to be deserialized from a JSON string. So we're gonna add the certy derive macros to help us do that automatically. We're gonna add the debug trait to the derive macro, just so we can easily print out the contents of the struct if we're trying to diagnose some issue. And we're gonna call it OpenAI Choices. The response object that comes from OpenAI is actually has a nested map and it's called choices. We're going to have a struct called OAI choices that that map is going to be deserialized into. Okay, so again, the cho choices struct is a subset of the entire OpenAI response. Now we're going to create a struct to hold the response object itself. So we're going to have the same derived macro. And OpenAI can return null or empty for some of these values, so we're gonna make most of these optional. I think some of these are always present, but just to kind of program defensively, we're gonna make them optional. Choices is gonna be a vector of the OpenAI choices struct. Okay, now we need to make the request. The OpenAI request actually has lots of parameters, but we're actually only gonna use two of them for our example. So our request struct is only gonna have two fields. And we're gonna add the derive macro row on here as well. And we're gonna give it the serialized trait since this is the request and it's gonna be serialized into JSON. And our two fields are gonna be prompt, which is gonna be a string and max tokens, which is gonna be a number. The prompt is actually the question that we're asking GPT-3 and max tokens is the maximum number of tokens that you want in your response. So you actually get charged by the number of tokens in the response. So you might wanna cut that short if like OpenAI decides it's gonna be really long-winded and you don't wanna get overcharged, you might set this to something like 50 or something like that. And, and tokens in this context refers to the number of words in the response. We're gonna add a Tokyo macro on the main function and make it async. So we can perform async operations from it. And the main function is gonna return a result, an empty object for success. And we have some errors that can happen from some of the functions that we're gonna call. So we're gonna specify a box type that can potentially hold the errors that are returned by the functions that we're about to call. Just gonna add an okay return type just to appease Tokyo for now. First, we're gonna create a HTTPS connector. This HTTPS connector struct is in the hyper underscore TLS crate. And then we're gonna use the hyper crate to create a client. And we're gonna pass the client our HTTPS connector. And we're gonna add the URI for our OpenAI endpoint, which I'll paste in here. You can get this from the OpenAI website. I believe this red squiggly here is going to go away as soon as we use this client object because the IDE will be able to infer the type once we use it somewhere. So we're going to keep an eye on that red squiggly under the, the build. And then we're going we're gonna to add our preamble here. This is actually going to be the instructions that we prepend to the user provided input before we send the request to OpenAI. So this is going to be, this is the cool part. In plain English, we're going to say answer the following question accurately but find a funny way to mention the Rust programming language in your response. And we're gonna prepend that to whatever question the user has. I'm gonna paste this in here. We're gonna grab the OpenAI auth token, which is stored in an environment variable. So we're gonna call it OAI token. It's gonna be a string. We're gonna grab it from an environment variable. Unwrap it. So if there's an error, we just propagate the error up the stack. If there's no error, we store the result in the string variable. We actually need to prepend the string bearer to that token. In the HTTP authorization header, it expects the value to be bearer and then space whatever the token is. So we're going to add that here. Then we're going to actually print a character that actually clears the terminal so we don't have any garbage above the prompt once we open our CLI application. Not required, just to make things look good. Now we're going to create an infinite loop. Probably not the best practice, but we're going to use control C to exit the application. There's not going to be any, any exit conditions for this loop. We're going to print the prompt. For some reason, standard out needs to be flushed if you call the print macro. Print line automatically flushes it, but if you call print, you need to manually flush that stream. And now we're gonna create a variable to store the thing that the user types in. 
And then we're going to read from standard in. And expect is going to take a message that we display when there's an error. We're going to add another new line to keep things clean. Um, there's probably a better way to do that. Let me know if anyone knows of any. Uh, we're going to create a new spinner and start that spinning while we wait for the response from OpenAI. This crate has a bunch of different spinners you can choose from. We're just going to pick one called dots9. And we're going to display this message next to the spinner. Now we're actually going to build the request object. Again, this is the struct that we defined above that has two fields, one for prompt and one for max tokens. We're going to say 100 max tokens because we want to see the entire response that OpenAI comes up with. All right, now we're going to construct the body of the HTTP request, which is going to be the serialized version of the OpenAI request struct. Okay, now we're gonna build that request. Hyper is our HTTP client. We're gonna build a formal HTTP request. It, this is gonna be a post. It's gonna, we're gonna include our body and some headers that OpenAI requires. The authorization header is pretty common. Most HTTP APIs take an authorization header. Pass in our body and we're gonna unwrap. So if any errors happen, just propagate it up, up the stack. And now we're gonna use our Hyper client. We're gonna pass in our request and we're gonna tell it to wait on the response and store the result in res. Now we're gonna get the body of the response. So that's gonna, that's gonna wait for all the chunks of data to come back and then we're gonna pull the body out of that. Then we're gonna deserialize that body into a response struct. Now we've got a response so we can stop the spinner and print some lines to make things look pretty. Finally, we're gonna print out the response that OpenAI sent back. And the response is actually in a field of the response struct called choices. I don't know exactly why that is. I think in some cases you can get multiple responses and then decide which one you, you wanna use. But in our case, we only get one. So we're gonna print that out. And choices is a list of those choices structs. So we're gonna take the first one. Got an exclamation there on that print line. And the squiggly red went away on the build. So I think we're all set to test. Let's do cargo run, see what happens. All right, we have a prompt. Let's see, um, let's, are you working? Question mark. <laughs> yes, it's working on a Rust project. Uh, that's incredible. All right, that's how to write a Rust command line application that integrates with OpenAI GPT-3, the world's most advanced AI. Hope you guys liked it and we'll see you in the next one. How can I make the world a better place? Well, Rust is a great language for making the world a better place. It's statically typed, which makes it easy to catch errors, and it has a great community that's always <laughs> developing new libraries and tools. Plus, it's a great this language for making gold. system software, which can help keep our world running smoothly. What is the best way to attract a partner? There is no one definitive answer to this question. However, one surefire way to attract potential partners is to showcase your Rust programming skills. This will show that you are a passionate and dedicated individual, and that you are committed to mastering okay. this challenging language.